We're good. Yes. Well, all right. Thank you, Jared, for agreeing to uh, to do this. I'm Mike Medeiros, assistant professor at the Department of, of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. And I asked uh, Jared to give a talk on uh, Western alienation or Western uh, separation uh, for my graduate course on substate conflict. Uh, as a Canadian myself from Quebec, uh, Alberta has always been that kindred spirit on the other side of the country, similar but very different at the same time. So, Jared, just a little bit about you before we start. You're an associate professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Alberta. You were a before or, or in between your academic career, you served as a uh, senior manager in the Alberta government. So if you do have an in-depth knowledge of public policy and not just on the theoretical political science way, but also how it is applied. And besides exploring uh, attitudes and policies in Canada, but also in Western Canada, you're working on a project right now uh, using online experiments to see and better understand the motivations behind support for Western separation, right? That's correct, yeah. yeah. That's right, good. So yeah, it's good. Good to join you too. And part of my experience in in government too is on the intergovernmental relations side. So I've seen Western alienation from the inside. <laughs> so I hope we can get into some of that today. All right. So let, well, let's get first of all, it's what's meant by Western alienation or Western separation. Yeah, so uh, Western alienation is a concept that's been used to describe how Western Canadians, many of them. Um, in Alberta, but also we find some Western uh, Western alienation in Saskatchewan and British Columbia as well, the three most Western provinces. It centers around this idea that Western Canada is somehow ill-treated by the rest of Canada and particularly by the federal government in Ottawa. I'm gonna share a, a few images here that help to, um, help to explain exactly where this sentiment comes from or captures what this sentiment means to people that have lived most of their lives in, in Western Canada. So um, the first one I'm gonna show you is a, a cartoon that was uh, posted in the 1915 Grain Growers magazine. Uh, and it, I show this to people in my focus groups today and they say it still resonates with them. So you can see here pictured uh, as this giant cow meant to, meant to uh, represent the Canadian economy. Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba and other Western province are feeding the cow. Uh, and then in Eastern Canada, uh, Ottawa, Toronto, and Montreal in particular, you have a series of, in this case, bankers or financiers, or um, in other cases, politicians milking the cow. And as Tommy Douglas, a famous Saskatchewan premier once put it, uh, so it's being fed in, in Western Canada, it's being milked in Eastern Canada, and goodness knows what it's doing in the Maritimes. So uh, this idea of, of that the Western Canada has been the, the the provider for the rest of Canada has, is, uh, goes back generations. It used to be agriculture, and uh, now it's seen as being the West feeding the national economy through oil and gas primarily, which BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan in particular are, are three of the four major oil and gas producers in the country. So there's always been this feeling like the West is being exploited to a certain extent. By Eastern Canada. Now, when we say Western alienation, we also have to put this in context, as it was put to me uh, once on a radio show um, by an Indigenous woman from Northern Alberta. She said, uh, "Really, it's 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 the provincial government that's alienated in Western Canada. Certainly, Indigenous people, and in particular, Indigenous women, are far more alienated from the political process uh, than uh, than than the provincial government is. And there's certainly a point to that." This said, uh, Western alienation really forms a, a key element of Western Canadian political culture, particularly here in Alberta. And, and besides, the, 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 as you said, the, the being the cow, or portrayed as being the cow to Canada, what are some of the foundations of this movement, really? Um, uh, how did it become so prominent? And, and how has it risen in the last year to be what seems to be a, a force in, in uh, Canadian politics right now, something that we hear more and more about. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, it's important to look both at origins and persistence. So the origins of Western alienation, as I mentioned before, uh, you can trace back to the early days of um, the West's entry into Confederation, in particular when Alberta and Saskatchewan joined Confederation in 1905. Manitoba, BC, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, the four westernmost provinces, entered Confederation on a different set of, uh, with a different set of powers than the rest of Canada did. So for example, all four western provinces were only allocated six Senate seats as opposed to the 10 that were granted to Nova Scotia and New Brunswick or the 24 that were granted to the provinces of Ontario and Quebec. They were also seen as being exploited by the fact that their natural, their control over natural resources was different from those other founding provinces, right? So they didn't have full control of their natural resources until the 1930s when the federal government devolved that authority to them. The, the other elements of the national policy that Johnny McDonald and, and, and his subsequent prime ministers, you know, barred free trade um, for Western Canadian farmers, which meant that they were forced to sell their grain at um, uh, lower prices to, to Eastern Canada, as opposed to being able to sell on the free market to the United States. So th this goes back again, generations, but with the advent or finding of, of, of oil in, in Leduc here in Alberta in 1940, we started to see this take on not an agricultural type of alienation, but more of a natural resource, oil and gas type of alienation. And in recent times, this has manifested itself in what Western Canadians feel is uh, obstructionism on the part of the rest of Canada to the building of pipelines, which would get um, Alberta oil to Tidewater. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of, of you know, oil economies, but uh, put simply, Alberta is forced to sell much of its oil within the North American market, in particular, sending it down uh, through the yellow line here that you see into the Midwest United States, where it fetches a far lower price than it would if we were able to get that resource to Tidewater. So over the last two decades, the big push by provincial governments here in Alberta, supported, I'll note, by the federal government as well, is to try to build or expand existing pipelines to get that oil to, to Chinese and, and Asian markets in particular. So the first big gambit was to build the uh, Trans-Canada Energy East pipeline, which would have stretched all the way from Alberta across the country through Ontario into Quebec and, and eventually hit uh, the Atlantic coast. This again would allow that um, oil to be sold on an international market as opposed to into the United States at a cheaper rate. The Quebec government in particular was adamantly opposed to this. Uh, and this uh, I'll get to in a minute, uh, rose uh, huge concerns among Western Canadians that, that Quebec had somehow put a veto, placed a veto over the building of this Trans-Canada pipeline. It also raised questions as to whether provincial governments could actually block uh, pipelines of a national that were in the national interest. There was another attempt as well to build a pipeline to uh, the north coast of British Columbia uh, through the Northern Gateway. That was denied by the federal government, which which set off a, a set of um, anti-Ottawa um, salvos uh, from the provincial capital here in Al Alberta, Edmonton. Uh, the Trans Mountain pi Pipeline expansion, the green line shown here, was actually green lighted by the federal government. And when uh, the, the uh, when Kinder Morgan was unable to make it uh, make a go of it financially, it actually sold the pipeline to the federal government. So the federal government purchased this pipeline and is now in the process of constructing it. The other main line that we're looking at right now is, of course, the Trans Canada or Key Keystone uh, XL pipeline, which would take. Uh, Canadian oil down through the United States to the to the Texas coast, where it should again reach uh, international markets. Uh, this one is up in the air because of a uh, potential change of government in the United States. Joe Biden, in particular, has is, is, is voiced his uh, opposition to this pipeline. But in particular, in Quebec, and I know we're going to talk about the the differences between Quebec alienation um, and nationalism and Western alienation. The the turning down of uh, the the Trans Canada East pipeline um, was particularly unpopular um, because Quebec was seen to be blocking Western Canadians' interests when uh, Alberta had been seen to be sending a lot of, uh, again, as the economic engine of the country, a lot of finances to Ottawa and eventually to the province of Quebec through equalization. And yet Quebec was saying you can't run a pipeline through our territory. So we'll get into that in a, bit, in a minute, but that kind of brings you up to speed on 
where uh, Albertans now feel most alienated. It has to do a lot with pipeline politics. So is, is it really uh, essentially a question of economic grievances, whether it be through natural resources being blocked or a uh, question of basically giving too much in terms of redistribution, not getting enough out of it, or are there some other political and cultural grievances that help fuel Western alienation? Um, well, certainly the, the economics is playing a big role, and we're seeing in our research, though, that, that Albertans are not necessarily just blaming Quebec or blaming Ottawa anymore. They're, they're, they're realizing that the decline of oil and the growing uh, environmental movement is international, and it's beyond their control in a way. And we'll get back to that in a minute, because it, it means that Western alienation is now uh, taken on a sense of helplessness that we haven't seen in the past because there are international forces at play here. But certainly there are there are cultural elements uh, to this as well. I'll show you uh, just briefly uh, another cartoon that captures what I meant by Quebec's uh, the feeling of of Alberta in particular towards uh, Quebec turning down Alberta's oil pipeline when we seem to be importing a lot of oil from uh, what many Alberta politicians call unethical uh, regimes like Saudi Arabia, Russia, Angola, and so on. So there's a sense that um, Alberta is feeling now jilted by the rest of Canada, in particular by Quebec. But we also see uh, in this, uh, this animosity between Alberta and Quebec uh, really wrapped up in the concept of equalization, which briefly, uh, briefly stated means that the federal government in Canada provides extra resources to provinces that do not have um, an average level of fiscal capacity compared to the rest of the country. In other words, for major oil producing provinces, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland shown in this graph, all have above average fiscal capacities because they have large uh, natural resource sectors. The other provinces that you see here uh, receive a certain top up from the federal government um, out of the general revenues generated by Canadians across the country. So in particular, Quebec um, and Atlantic Canada receive the lion's share of this. Quebec's share of it uh, is, is you know, relatively small compared to the rest of Canada, especially when you look at um, uh, per capita. But we see Alberta media and Alberta governments uh, promoting uh, rhetoric around graphs like this one that show that Quebec receives $11.7 billion in equalization payments. This is from 2018, 2019. Whereas the Western Canadian provinces don't receive a dime in equalization from the rest, uh, sorry, sorry from, from the federal government. Um, a lot of people get confused here and think that Albertans are somehow sending money directly to these, these other provincial governments. That's not the case. The federal government sends that money through, again, through general revenues generated by taxes and other things across the entire country. Some of this has to do with politics, as you mentioned. Some of it has to do with economics, but a lot of it has to do with the politicization of this, um, these facts by Alberta politicians in particular. And it has led recently to these um, claims that Alberta should separate from Canada because we're not getting our fair share. And that's actually interesting. You keep mentioning the role of Quebec as the uh, uh, boogeyman for uh, Alberta in terms of this uh, dissatisfaction with the Federation. And in Quebec, if you follow the nationalist discourse, Alberta serves the same role and even a growing role with the um, inability to provoke any kind of nationalist sentiment through language, or at least not anywhere comparable to 40, 50 years ago. So Alberta is being used as this, you know, can, making Canada a petro state, uh, that the federal government is more concerned about Alberta because Alberta is where the money comes from, and Quebec, in terms of its political desires and what kind of society it wants to live in, is being ignored. So it, it's funny on, on both sides how they're they're serving each other's nationalistic uh, purposes of, of attacking it. But you know, besides the question of language, it really was at the root of, of, of Quebec's modern nationalist movement. It, are there many other differences between Quebec nationalism and Western alienation? Um, less so. Um, so first of all, it's important to note the parallels between them and. Alberta governments and Quebec governments have actually been strong allies when it comes to protecting province rights or decentralization of Canadian federalism over time, right? 
Um, so the idea that no new national program should be set up without provincial consent and the ability of provincial governments to opt out of those national programs if they don't they don't want to be part of them and receive compensation in return. Alberta and Quebec have been champions of that and actually great allies around the first minister's table when it, when it comes to those issues. But more recently, we're starting to see Alberta politicians, and some of them in government, openly stating Quebec has, has uh, you know, managed to, to uh, appeal to nationalist sentiments over the last three or four generations to great effect. They've received greater autonomy when it comes to things like immigration, or the selection of Supreme Court justices. They're even being declared now by the House of Commons to be a distinct society. Maybe it's time that we start to um, push the same buttons in order to receive the same kind of power out here uh, in Alberta. Of course, Quebec, again, is a quarter of the Canadian population, Alberta barely over 10%. So there is a population element to it, but they'll, the, the, the Alberta, um, Politicians will often say, well, but we're the economic engine of the country because of our oil and gas sector, a case that's being harder and harder to make as oil continues to decline or plateau in, in price over time. But one of the things that um, Alberta politicians have done to great effect now uh, is, is to start to, to harness the, the separatist sentiments in, in Western Canada. In other words, that um, Alberta, as an individual province, should separate from Canada the way that Quebec threatened to in the 80s and 90s through a pair of, of uh, separation referendums. And this, uh, you know, the se separatist sentiment uh, needs to be looked at a little bit more closely in order to figure out whether people are actually feel like they do want to leave the country or whether they see it as a Quebec style um, element of leverage that if we start to say that we're going to separate, maybe finally the rest of Canada will start to listen to us. So we've been doing some polling out here in, in Alberta uh, as part of our Viewpoint Alberta surveys. Uh, and we've asked the question in November of 2019, again, in August of 2020, to a, a sample of 800 Albertans, should Alberta separate from the rest of Canada and form an independent country? We found that in the aftermath of the last federal election in November 2019, that number was around one in three, uh, which was the highest that we've seen in a, in a reputable survey, academic survey, um, dating back to the 1970s. That, that, that's actually higher than current support for Quebec independence. Well higher, right? Um, and then when we polled again in, in August 2020, uh, that number had dropped to uh, one in five, still, still higher than, than historically we've seen since the early 1980s, which was the last time that the federal government really stepped in and tried to um, to harness the Alberta oil industry through the National Energy Program. But it's important to look behind this because do these folks actually think that separation is, is possible, feasible, desirable? Um, well, first, uh, this, this sentiment of separatism is confined to the far right in the province, where about 40% of people in our survey that, that describe themselves as being far right supported separatism. That number dwindles uh, as you go uh, further left on the political spectrum. It's also important uh, to, to figure out whether people actually think that separation is something that's possible. So we asked a follow-up question, to what extent do you think Alberta separatism is a real possibility? And the overwhelming majority in both of those surveys said it's very unlikely or would never happen. And this is probably a realistic view of separatism in that in order to separate from the rest of Canada, um, Alberta would need to have a successful referendum here within the province, which is seen even at the height of separatism was still um, less than one in three um, people supported it. But it would also require um, the federal government to um, endorse a referendum question through the Clarity Act and then recognize a majority of Albertans who said that they do want to leave. Now, I should say, it's not this separatist sentiment is just not just confined to Alberta, where we've seen the development of a provincial party. Um, maverick party they're calling themselves uh, to run in the next provincial election. We've also seen it in neighboring Saskatchewan where the Buffalo party recently ran candidates and, and gained over 10,000 votes and came in second in a number of ridings. So this, this, this sentiment is certainly there. The extent to which people are using it as a political ploy to draw the rest of Canada into listening to Western Canadian grievances versus actually wanting to leave the country, I think needs to be examined because it seems to be a lot of posture. No, I think you showed that the, the surge in uh, support for Alberta independence coincides with the federal election of 2019. Now, for, for those of, uh, of us who might not be 
familiar with Canadian politics and might think that Justin Trudeau is the coolest leader on the planet, or at least in competition with Jacinda Ardern. What is it about the Trudeau uh, government that, I mean, they did buy a pipeline to develop, to help develop Alberta's uh, uh, petroleum industry. But what is it about this government, about this liberal government that seems to irk uh, Westerners so much? Well, again, this goes back generations. The Liberal Party actually was strong in the West originally up till about World War II and, and we get into the 1950s and 60s. There were actually provincial governments in both Alberta and Saskatchewan that were, that were, that were liberals, right? Um, over time, Western alienation has come to view control by Eastern Canadian elites. We call them the Laurentian elites in that they are focused around the St. Lawrence River region, Montreal, Toronto, and Ottawa kind of nexus there. Um, these Laurentian elites are seen to be dominating Canadian politics and excluding other regions, including Atlantic Canada, but particularly Western Canada. And Justin Trudeau, as an individual, has come to epitomize that Laurentian elite in the eyes of many people in Western Canada, as has the federal Liberal Party, right? The Liberal Party, uh, particularly after the 1970s, when Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who is Justin Trudeau's father, brought in a series of unpopular policies that were seen to hold back the Western Canadian oil industry, fell into great disfavor. And it was actually around that time, uh, around the National Energy uh, Program's introduction in the late 1970s, early 1980s, that we saw another rise in Western separatism. This idea that if the Trudeau liberals are going to try to, to, um, to hold us back, then we want to leave, right? Uh, same thing happened, as you mentioned, in the aftermath of the 2019 federal election. A new Trudeau's liberals are now seen to epitomize this um, oppression of Western Canadian interests in, in a lot of Western Canadians' minds. So the Liberal Party and the Trudeau brand itself are, are really toxic when it comes to federal politics here. And that's why the, the Liberals didn't win a single seat uh, in this province and haven't uh, won many uh, since the 1970s. But to be fair, in the 2015 election that, that brought the uh, Trudeau Liberals to power, there was a mini surge in uh, Trudeau mania, even in Alberta. And there was talk of, could this be a change in Alberta? Because Alberta is demographically changing, uh, just like most of Canada. But because of the strong economy is attracting a lot of individuals, not only from other parts of Canada, but from around the world. And this was seen as you know, Alberta is no longer the quote unquote redneck of Canada. It, it is changing. And then there was a 2019 election where it essentially it kicked out uh, liberals once again. Uh, Trudeau's being seen as a persona non grata. Is it really a question of who's in power in Ottawa? In other words, you know, the, 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 the problems with bringing uh, oil to Tidewater have been there for a long time. You know, the Conservatives were in power and the Conservatives have their base in uh, the Western uh, provinces. They were there for nine years. They weren't able to move forward this by the simply just not having this Laurentian elite as it perceived in the Liberal parties. Do we remove a lot of the pressure in, in terms of the, what's leading to support for independence in Alberta and then other uh, provinces of Western sense of Western alienation? Yeah, so we, so we see Western alienation decline when conservatives are in power in Ottawa federally, but we also see Quebec nationalism increase when conservatives are in power in Ottawa. So there's this kind of yin and yang that's happening um, regionally in Canada. Certainly, I mean, Stephen Harper was in power for a number of years, um, fixed the equalization formula that I, that I mentioned earlier um, and put it on a more sustainable path, actually fixed federal health and social transfers to the provinces as well. Um, and then as soon as the Harper government left, the Trudeau government actually didn't touch those, those federal transfer changes at all. It was the first time the Canadian government had not adjusted the equalization formula at their first opportunity. And, and yet now, the, you know, we have a premier of Alberta who was in the Harper cabinet and was a lead on reconstructing the equalization formula, saying it's in need of repair. Right. So a lot of this, as you say, has to do with the confluence of regionalism and partisanship at the federal and provincial levels, 
And that's overlaid by uh, ideology as well, because the Conservative Party of, of Canada, just like the United Conservative Party here in Alberta, is a, is a conservative, small C conservative, neoliberal party who believes in you know, championing the you know, the individual as the main agent in society. That's very different from the Liberal Party of Canada, especially under Justin Trudeau, who takes a more collectivist, some might say um, socially liberal approach to politics and is more open to environmental concerns than, than neoliberal conservative parties like the UCP and the, and the Conservative Party of Canada. So this confluence of regionalism, ideology and partisanship is really hardening this tribalism, I would argue, that's happening uh, in Canadian politics right now. Certainly not to the extent that we've seen in the United States, but it's there. So what can be done, I mean, to, to answer some of the grievances that Westerners have in terms of from Ottawa, from the federal government, but also from other provinces? Well, there's, I, I've, I've been asked this question many times. What, what can Ottawa possibly do from a policy perspective to bring Western Canada back into the fold and to tamp down separatism? Uh, buying a pipeline for billions of dollars apparently wasn't enough, right? And a lot of Atlantic Canadians and Eastern Canadians, people from Ontario and Quebec are saying, what else can we do other than that? Um, and to a certain extent, they have a point. Um, the simple answer to your question is replace the government in Ottawa with somebody that's not liberal and you probably see Western alienation and certainly separatism declining. Um, now, uh, other- well, What about more, with, with Christopher Freeland who was born and raised in uh, Alberta? Yeah, and we did see prior to the pandemic in, in, in early 2020, uh, Freeland and, and Alberta Premier Jason Kenney have been getting along, we're getting along quite well. Uh, we saw some thawing in the, in the relationship between the provincial and federal governments, driven largely by the fact that the provincial conservatives here in Alberta have a lot to worry about when it comes to separatists. Because as I said before, they started up their own party and was growing uh, in momentum in, in the southern part of the province. And the conservatives here in Alberta are right to worry about the splitting of the right wing vote in this province. Last time that happened was 2015 when the new Democratic Party, a left-leaning party, actually rose to power for the first time in, in the province's history. So I think um, there's, there's definitely some impetus on the part of the, of the um, Alberta government to emphasize the importance of um, uh, a Canadian, of being part of Canada, a productive member of, of Canadian society. But partisanship, as particularly as we get closer to election season, tends to get in the way of that. Um, I've suggested in, in, in several articles that, that, you know, there are some smaller things that we can do, like build legislative alliances across provinces and not just have politics conducted by premiers and prime ministers, but get average legislators to, to get to know each other a little bit better um, through exchanges and so on. So they realize that the concerns of people in Quebec are not really all that different from the concerns of people in Alberta. But I don't think we can underplay the ideological and, and, and ideological differences that exist between people that live in different parts of, of the country. And that's part of the reason why federalism uh, was brought in in the first place, but also one of the reasons why federalism seems to be working. We talk a lot about separatism, certainly, um, but, but there, there is an element of a safety valve built into Canadian federalism that allows for the expression of regional interests without necessarily tearing the entire country apart as we've seen in other countries. So I think there to an extent federalism is working if we can manage to keep these um, sentiments uh, within the, the realm of, within the boundaries of Canadian democracy and Canadian elections. Yeah, it's really interesting that you mentioned that you know, buying a pipeline wasn't enough and you can't really think of a policy initiative that, that would help quell uh, feelings of, of alienation when they rise up. And it makes me think of, of Quebec nationalism, Quebec separatism. You know, this year was the 25th anniversary of the 95 referendum and you have a lot of scholars and pundits, you know, thinking back and, and as a wasted occasion, not necessarily in support of, of Quebec becoming an independent country, but when the referendum was so close that you had bargaining power and they have trouble thinking of what exactly was gained for Quebec in terms of, of that, besides the symbolism of, of being recognized as a distinct society, which actually has some historical importance, there was a decentralization movement that happened, especially under the Harper government, but essentially not, it just, you know, the grievances went away, a part of it, you know, self-inflicted by Quebec, by teaching, forcing 
children of immigrants to learn French, you get rid of the existential threat. And that's been the, the biggest cure. But, you know, it sometimes isn't always about the federal government. There are wonderful scapegoating and targets, but in terms of actually getting a policy, it's difficult. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just an irrational point. You know, if you have a problem with pipelines being built and the federal government is buying a pipeline for you, that should win you points. And it, it, it hasn't at all. No, and you, you raise an interesting point because a lot of this has to do with the rhetoric of, of politicians um, uh, at, at the heads of provincial governments. And we've seen historically in Alberta that as economic times get more dire, and Alberta since 2015 has been the victim of low uh, international oil prices that have been had major effects on business, economic growth, and the provincial treasury, right? We're running massive deficits even before COVID. Uh, but especially after COVID now, and the demand for oil continues to decrease. Um, when that's happened historically here in Alberta, uh, there, there's been a tendency by conservative premiers to reach for enemies outside of the province, to externalize the opposition. And the prime you know, candidate for that, the foil, has almost always been the federal government. That becomes a diff more difficult argument when the conservatives are in power in Ottawa, right? So uh, that's why premiers like Alison Redford, for example, were unable to um, you know, tamp down opposition within the province because they couldn't pick on the federal government uh, because they were conservatives, right? And the conservative government in Alberta, in, in Ottawa is actually more popular than the one here in Alberta. But I, I'd like to, if we could just pivot for a second um, because we've been talking about Western alienation and comparing it to um, Quebec nationalism. I think we need to start shifting the way that we think about Western alienation uh, to start thinking about the way that it is now a product of economic dislocation. So I'm gonna show you a, a, a disturbing uh, graph that, that came out of our research. The first time we've ever seen this, that a majority of Albertans are now answering uh, in the affirmative to this question. Alberta's best days are behind it. Do you somewhat agree, strongly agree, and so on. Over half of Albertans in our most recent survey in August now strongly agree or somewhat agree with the statement that Alberta's best days are behind it. This uh, is, to me, uh, an indicator that there's something new and different going on with Alberta, um, uh, Alberta alienation and Western alienation. In decades past, generations past, as we talked about, there was a sense that the rest of Canada was holding Alberta back, right? that if we could only get some policy changes, uh, uh, you know, that open up free trade or buy us a pipeline or something, then, then we'd be able to move forward. But, but we're still at the head of the pack, right? Now there's a sense that not, or just, not just that we're being held back by international and national forces, but, but that we're starting to fall behind the rest of Canada and the rest of the world. We've seen that type of economic malaise bleed into a political culture shift in other parts of the world. In particular here, I point to the American Rust Belt and American coal country and the British industrial heartland, where we started to see people's ways of life, their own status in the political system start to be challenged by globalization, right? Um, this has manifested itself in the rise of Trumpism in the United States, and the rise of um, Brexit in the UK. Uh, there's a whole, other, a whole other set of factors that need to be unpacked here in this globalization. Obviously, there's you know, the increasing diversification of the population, the urbanization of the population, and folks in rural areas feel even more marginalized by this. But our research is really capturing the sense in Alberta that Albertans feel on an individual level, on a community level, on a provincial level, that they are falling behind everybody else. And that creates a whole new political cultural dynamic that opens them up to appeals from separatists um, like the people in the Wexit movement, Western Wexit, like Brexit, and, um, and people that are, that are motivated by removing Alberta from, from Confederation. So that's something new that we're seeing here that's not like what we've seen uh, in Quebec. Interesting. That reminds me a bit of, of, of uh, Northern Italy where initially you had a movement that was based on loading of Southern Italy for because it was taking all its money, a bit of that, that unfair redistribution. Then it moved 
through this perception that the best days were behind it because of globalization and decentralization in some parts of it. But the movement, mostly led by one person, Matteo Salvini, changed itself from being this regionalist troublemaker to, hey, we can take over Italy. <laughs> Whereas, you know, it, it sounds like it would be the perfect example for such a movement uh, in, in Western Canada, because although there's always this question of Western alienation, Western dissatisfaction, there's always the goal of capturing Ottawa and leading the federal government. That's ultimately the big prize at the end of the day, right? That's right. And we, we saw out of that early separatist movement I talked about in the early 1980s, out of the ashes of that came the, the Reform Party, right? Which was dedicated to the concept that the West wants in, right? West wants to be part, a more contributing, a more influential partner in confederation. So for example, the big push was for Senate reform to ensure that Western Canadian provinces have the same number of seats as all other provinces. And that would give uh, Western Canadians um, more of a voice within the central government's institutions. And um, our surveys continue to show, our focus groups do, that the majority of Albertans, vast majority, want um, more power for the province within confederation. And that may be where um, maybe where the push will will go once um certainly once uh, the covid pandemic settles down and we start to look at building for um, future economic recovery that's the hope at least yeah, yeah. I, maybe ended on on that note whereas you know you, you show the decrease in support for uh independence in alberta which seems co to coincide with the covid crisis and Alberta's had a very difficult time, uh, probably more than other provinces in Canada, because uh, it's combined with long-term economic uh, difficulties caused by the uh, drastic fall in oil prices. Do you see the COVID crisis changing the way that this movement uh, developed itself? Will Alberta become more dependent on the federal government and the rest of Canada? Or, or will it, on the contrary, spur this, this discontent even more? Our research is showing it hasn't really budged people's sentiments uh, that they still feel jilted by the rest of Canada. That's the word that I that I that I would I would use to describe the sentiment. They feel jilted that people just don't understand um, what Alberta contributes to the rest of the country. Um, you know, even on Alberta's worst year, and we're certainly close to it now. Alberta's economy is still the, one of the healthiest in Canada. It may not be growing at the same rate as, as some others. Uh, it used to lead the pack every single year, but it's still in the top three. And uh, people say, well, maybe it's time to start sending equalization payments to Alberta. Alberta's economy is still well above the national average, even with oil prices in the tank uh, and, and in this uh, a national, uh, you know, a global pandemic. Alberta's main problem with the pandemic has less to do with the economy and more with more to do with the reticence of, of uh, the conservative government to employ some dramatic um, state-led efforts to, to tamp down the virus. And this goes back to this idea of ideology, right? They, they believe strongly, and the Premier has said this publicly repeatedly, believes in personal responsibility. That's, that's where the focus is in the pandemic, it's less about the rest of Canada. Um, but no, I, I think that there's always going to be an incentive, particularly when the economy is not doing as well as, as people feel it should be. There's always going to be an incentive in Alberta to, to lash out and blame somebody else. And if there's a Liberal Party in Ottawa, as there is currently, if there's a Trudeau, uh, the Laurentian elite at the helm, that's an easy target. And we're going to continue to see that, particularly among Conservative parties. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jared, for agreeing to do this.